Welcome everyone to this week's research seminar at Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation. My name is Harold Trincunas, Deputy Director here at CSAC. Uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce you today uh, to you our uh, speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Dan Zimmer. Uh, Dan is a Stanford Existential Risk Initiative postdoctoral uh, scholar uh, here at CSAC. Um, he received his PhD in uh, government from Cornell University and previously uh, a master's in social science from the University of Chicago. His PhD thesis was entitled The Imminent Apocalypse, Humanity and the End of the World. He is the first Stanford Existential Risk Initiative postdoc and he's been working assiduously on his book during his time at CSAC. Today he'll talk on the politics of universality in the Earth System Anthropocene. Before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Zimmer, uh, just a quick reminder, uh, there'll be a Q&A period after Dr. Zimmer is uh, done with his presentation. One finger to get on the queue, two fingers to jump the queue to address the matter immediately at hand. And for our online audience, uh, please enter your questions in the Q&A function of Zoom. Over to you, Dan. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Harold. Thank you all of you for coming out here today and to CSAC for allowing me to present. Um, it's a deep regret of mine that my teaching schedule uh, conflicts with the CSAC seminar this quarter, but I'm really glad to have finally had the opportunity to appear at least one. So um, given that, uh, let's begin. In February of 2000, the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, or IGBP, convened for its 13th annual conference in Cuernavaca, Mexico. By now, the IGBP had become a leading nexus for connecting biologists, geologists, physicists, climatologists, and planet observers of all types. This year, one attendee, the atmospheric chemist and newly minted Nobel Research, often referring to the Holocene, the most recent geological epoch in the Earth's history, to set the context for their work. Krutzen, vice chair of the IGBP at the time, was becoming visibly agitated at this usage. And after the term Holocene was mentioned yet again, he interrupted them saying, stop using the word Holocene. We're not in the Holocene anymore. We're in the, 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 the Anthropocene, end quote. What was the reasoning behind this outburst? Krutzen put forward a brief explanation of his thinking in the pages of the IGBP newsletter a few months later. Here, he highlighted the degree to which human-initiated developments had broken with the comparative placidity of the preceding Holocene epoch. He stressed how the last several centuries had seen the human population increase tenfold and convert half the planet. Members of the IPC community have been poorly adopted to the scene almost immediately, finding in it a shorthand for capturing today's laundry list of human caused planetary disturbances. However, as many of you may know, the Anthropocene has achieved a far frostier reception in the humanities and humanistic social sciences. Here, although few doubt the severity of the crises themselves, a highly vocal chorus of scholars have rejected the Anthropocene on either conceptual or terminological grounds. Dissatisfaction with the term has grown so strong, in fact, that a recent survey has found 92 proposed alternative names for the contemporary epoch. As you can see, some of these names, such as the Manthropocene, Eurocene, or Capitalocene, seek to more directly diagnose the cause of today's crises, while others, such as the Cosmopolocene or Symbiocene, try to orient people towards the search for solutions, while still others, such as the Neologism scene or anthropo obscene, call attention to the intensity of the Anthropocene debates themselves. But you're probably wondering, why all this furor? Why did some of your colleagues over on the Humanities Quad find the notion that we are living in the Anthropocene so objectionable that they have proposed upwards of 100 other names to define our increasingly deranged planetary circumstances? The purpose of this talk is to offer an incipiently retrospective look at the Anthropocene debates 
More specifically, I'm going to be arguing that some of the most salient critiques that have been leveled against the Anthropocene, while valid in themselves, sometimes risk obscuring as much as they reveal. Uh, this talk will consist of three main parts. Part one will offer a brief account of what I take to be the consensus position among the Anthropocene's critics and the anti-humanist objections that underlie their critiques. Part two will then offer a short history of the Anthropocene that traces its conceptual precursors back to a new kind of universalism that arose in the 1950s out of the collision between cybernetics and thermonuclear weapons. Part three will then conclude by offering several takeaways concerning how these different kinds of universality might be applied to contemporary topics such as solar geoengineering. So let's begin with part one and the question of why so many humanity scholars have reacted to the notion of the Anthropocene so negatively. Here, I think the answer is in itself quite straightforward, although it may need some unpacking. The short version would be to say that the Anthropocene has been target, targeted for implicitly positing a universal anthropos that anti-humanist scholars believe to be the return of their old foe enlightenment humanist man in a new guise. Now, what does that mean? For those um, of you who are trained in the quantitative sciences, it may seem paradoxical to learn that many scholars in the humanities have vehemently rejected Western humanism. That being said, they have their reasons. Uh, as the names on the slide indicate, the philosophical revolt event against humanism began in Germany in the 1920s before taking over France in the 1960s, and then finally becoming a kind of critical common sense in the American Academy during the 1990s. I would be happy to say more about the philosophical origins and political implications of anti-humanism during the Q&A. At present, suffice it to say that by the middle of the last century, many European observers had rightly noted that the recent spate of world wars, pogroms, and genocides had all been perpetrated by self-styled humanists in the name of fostering greater human flourishing, uh, whether of a socialist, communist, conservative, fascist, or liberal variety. Where the universalist humanism of the Enlightenment had promised to replace an irrational faith in God with a rational faith in man, it seemed only to have succeeded in transforming man into an ersatz God himself and sacrificing tens of millions of people on his altar. Uh, for all of its high ideals, humanism seemed to possess a deeply dehumanizing dark side defined by a disturbing willingness to exclude or eliminate whatever it judged lacking. So for many of these scholars, there seemed to be an easy through line between uh, Leonardo da Vinci's famous idealization of the Vitruvian man, Arno Brecker, the famous Nazi sculpture's idealization of Aryan man, and the pile of shoes for all the people who did not fit the Nazi ideal as assembled at Auschwitz. Uh, looked at from the outside, it seemed increasingly clear that to philosophers that Western humanists had fashioned their definitions of universal man in their own particular self-image, and thereby relegated women, children, laborers, foreigners, ethnic minorities, and colonial subjects to consistently subhuman status. By the mid-2000s, the influential art critic Alam Abigail Solomon Godot could aptly sum up the anti-humanist consensus with the purely rhetorical question, have we not by now learned that the universalist notion of man is a figure of exclusion and repression? Given all this, it should come as no surprise the generation of scholars who are habituated in, uh, to view universal humanist claims with reflexive suspicion would have reacted strongly to the Anthropocene when they first encountered it in the early 2010s. Many of these scholars were quick to perceive that talk of the Anthropocene epoch implied the existence of a correspondingly universal humanity or anthropos underlying it. From here, many drew the reasonable conclusion that the anthropos merely represented the opportunity to return, uh, the opportunistic return of humanist man during a moment of planetary crisis. It is difficult to overstate how consistently anti-humanist the critiques of the Anthropocene have been in the humanities over the last decade. So I thought I would give you all a moment to just peruse this collage of representative quotes that I've assembled. To be clear, I think that all of these objections have merit, for if it is true that philosophical attempts to positively define humankind necessarily create the criteria for excluding some and dehumanizing others, then one should reject the Anthropocene and its putative anthropos for either its dangerous presumption or its insidious naivete. At best, this return of universal man would seem to unjustly impose collective human responsibility for crises that have been caused by the disproportionate actions of a relative few with the added injustice, it's the people who have contributed least who stand to suffer most. 
Even worse, critics of the Anthropocene warn that it naturalizes a particular historical and culturally contingent definition of a human, and by doing so, makes it appear as if today's crises arise from a tragic but inescapable flaw in human nature, rather th than from social arrangements that it is within human power to alter. In other words, by attributing today's planetary crises to universal man, the Anthropocene normalizes destructive practices such as capitalism, colonialism, and extractivism as the inevitable expression of human nature. At the same time, it universally implicates all human beings equally in dynamics that have been disproportionately driven by a relative few for their own private gain. I think that these critiques are valid and important when addressed to the anthropos or the Anthropocene as conceived in humanist terms. And to be clear, there are certainly some who have attempted to rhetorically abuse the Anthropocene in precisely the way that anti-humanists allege. At the same time, however, I think that it's equally important to recognize that the Anthropocene did not originate from within the world of Western humanism, uh, but instead took root on a distinctly different conceptual terrain that first emerged in the 1950s. And so with that, I will now turn to part two of this talk and offer a brief account of what I believe to be the Anthropos of the Anthropocene and how it took shape as something categorically different from the universal man of classical Western humanism. Uh, perhaps the best way to begin this story would be in July of 1955. It was here that a dozen eminent scientists delivered the famous Russell Einstein Manifesto, and with it, a new approach to human universality. The authors opened their address by declaring, we're speaking on this occasion, not as members of this or that nation, continent or creed, but as human beings, members of the species man whose continued existence is in doubt. This newfound doubt, they explained, had been inspired by successful testing of a new class of thermonuclear or hydrogen or H bomb, able to generate yields of over a thousand times uh, that of the weapon that leveled Hiroshima. A device of the scale, they warned, quote, sends radioactive particles into the upper air that sink gradually and reach the surface of the earth in the form of a deadly dust or rain. No one knows how widely such lethal radioactive particles might be diffused but the best authorities are unanimous in saying that a war with H-bombs might possibly put an end to the human race. It is feared that if many H-bombs are used, there will be universal death, sudden only for a fortunate minority, but for the majority, a slow torture of disease and disintegration." End quote. Where formerly talk of universal humanity had been a matter of philosophical or humanist abstraction, the new scale of hydrogen weapons had for the first time transformed the totality of human beings into an all too empirical object that could now be directly affected by human actions, albeit so far only in the form of its total erasure. This new state of total precarity seemed to have changed nothing less than the human condition itself, prompting the political theorist Hannah Arendt to reflect in 1958 how, in her words, now that atomic weapons used by one country might ultimately come to be the end of all human life on earth, mankind, which for all preceding generations was no more than a concept or an ideal, has now become something of an urgent reality." End quote. Ironically, though in hindsight, perhaps not surprisingly, this newfound capacity to cause universal death wound up playing an important role in revolutionizing the understanding of planetary life and ecology. By the 1950s, the field of ecology had been around for almost a century, but had long since conspicuously stalled. In 1952, the creator of this elegant mandala uh, aptly summarized the state of the field as follows, noting how, quote, even though it is possible to analyze an organism's environment and to study the effects of a single factor, it has long been recognized by ecologists that the environment organism system is a dynamic unit in itself and reacts as a whole. The complexity of the interrelationships between the organism and its environment and between the various factors of the environment is almost enough to discourage any attempts at complete analysis and, synth and synthesis." End quote. However, this was 1952. And by then, uh, change was already quite literally in the air in the form of radionuclides released by the hydrogen bomb. Looking back later, the influential American ecologist Barry Commoner recalled in his words how, despite already having a PhD in biology, I learned about the environment from the United States Atomic Energy Commission, or AEC, in 1953. Until then, like most people, I had taken the air, water, soil, and our natural surroundings more or less for granted. Each nuclear explosion thrust radioactivity into the environment, the elaborate communication network in which every living thing is enmeshed, with results that no one wanted or could have predicted." End quote. A new field of systems ecology quickly sprang up to parse the glowing tangle of connections that these radionuclides revealed both within and between ecosystems. Some early systems ecologists such as Howard Odom received large grants from the AEC, um, their environmental science branch to do things like study the flow of energy in coral reefs at nuclear testing sites or irradiate a patch of Puerto Rican rainforest 
as depicted here in a perhaps inappropriately whimsical cartoon drawn by Ann Odom, his wife. Uh, other early systems ecologists, such as Commoner, uh, worked counter to the federal government using studies such as the famous baby tooth survey to show how a radioactive isotope of strontium, which is chemically similar to calcium, had worked its way through the biosphere and into the bones and teeth of children. For all these systems ecologists, however, it was equally true that, in Commoner's words, quote, the single fact that an ecosystem consists of multiple interconnected parts which act on one another has some surprising consequences. Our ability to picture the behavior of such systems has been helped considerably by the development, even more recently than ecology, of the science of cybernetics." End quote. While the first radioisotope tracers revealed that ecosystems were far more complex than previously imagined, it was the new science of cybernetics that helped the first generation of systems ecologists to begin to come to grips with this complexity. First formulated in the 1940s, cybernetics had by then emerged as an influential but ill-defined grab bag of equations, modeling techniques, and loose analogies drawn from several decades worth of breakthroughs in fields such as information theory, control engineering, and the mathematics of nonlinear systems. Cybernetics offered, in the words of one early exponent, a method for the scientific treatment of systems in which complexity is outstanding and too important to be ignored. Early cyberneticians set out to study how complex systems, both living and non-living, process matter, energy, and information to resist the tug of entropy and re temporarily remain themselves as themselves. Uh, where traditional scientific methods had sought to dismantle complex systems and study their parts in isolation, cybernetics offered a new way to appreciate the properties that only um, emerged dynamically in the patterns formed by the parts themselves and the relations between them. The systems ecologists of the 1960s and 1970s drew on the techniques of cybernetics to begin to transform an abstract in intimation of holism as witnessed here into increasingly precise functional diagrams. By the end of the 1970s, the ancient awareness that everything is connected had not only become a mainstay of hippie counterculture, but an area of uh, cutting edge research as well. By the early 1980s, few groups had gone further in demonstrating this universal interconnection than atmospheric scientists whose object of in inquiry interfaced intimately with most other planetary systems. Their discipline had recently been transformed by breakthroughs in both computer modeling and data wrangling, as explained in magisterial detail in the 2010 volume of Ask Machine by CSAC's own Paul Edwards. Uh, there is a fascinating history of how, like systems ecology, the development of atmospheric science came to be catalyzed by nuclear weapons research uh, for reasons of time. However, suffice it to say that by the early 1980s, advances in global climate modeling had made it newly possible to predict with growing confidence how human-caused disturbances might disrupt the global climate system. Paul Crutzen once again played a crucial role here. In 1982, Crutzen teamed up with a colleague to develop a two-dimensional model that coupled photochemistry and atmospheric dynamics to explore a question that had gone disturbingly unaddressed for decades. Namely, what might the climate, climatic effects be of the global pall of soot and smoke lofted from urban and forest firestorms in the wake of a thermonuclear war? The subtitle of the resulting paper, Twilight at Noon, gave the answer. This in turn inspired the astronomer and science popularizer Carl Sagan to assemble his own team to study the subject in greater detail. The resulting 1983 paper is famous for finding that the atmospheric cooling effects of a thermonuclear war could be di dire enough to justify dubbing the resulting months of cold and dark a nuclear winter. Less well remembered is the fact that a fantastically energetic Sagan also assembled a panel of some 50 leading biologists to assess the ecological consequences of these findings. As summarized by Paul Ehrlich, he and his fellow biologists had had no trouble in agreeing that once they combined the known harms of nuclear weapons with the systemic planet-wide disruptions caused by nuclear winter, they, in his words, could not exclude the possibility of a full-scale nuclear war in training the extinction of Homo sapiens. A fellow pan panelist, the chemical biologist Thomas Eisner, seemed to speak for many when noting, quote, I have come now to realize that the impact of nuclear war is all encompassing and fundamentally biological. Synergisms and cascading effects are common consequence of environmental disruptions and tend to be unpredictable and recognizable only after the fact. What is predictable about the biological consequences of nuclear war is bad enough, but might the actual consequences be even worse? For four decades, we've remained ignorant about the possibility of nuclear winter. What else might we be overlooking? Systems ecologists had been arguing that environmental problems could not be understood in isolation since at least the early 1970s. However, the looming question of what else might we be overlooking 
helped to finally spur a concerted undertaking in this area. With news of nuclear winter already swirling, 1983 saw administrators at NASA convene a high-level committee charged with establishing an integrated framework for studying how the Earth might function dynamically as a system of systems. The NASA committee staged a grand coming out party for the resulting approach three years later, dubbing their new synthesis logically, if not too creatively, Earth system science. In justifying this undertaking, the newly minted Earth system scientists explained how, quote, studies of the continents, oceans, atmosphere, biosphere, and ice cover over the past 30 years have revealed that these are components of a far more dynamic and complex world than could have been imagined only a few generations ago. These investigations have also delineated with increasing clarity the complex interactions among the Earth's components and the profound effects of these interactions upon the Earth's history and evolution. Our new knowledge is providing us with a deeper insight into the Earth as a system." End quote. The new Earth system scientists sought to demonstrate the explanatory power of their approach by releasing the Bretherton diagram, so named for the chair of the committee. Uh, they offered this in both a more complex and a simplified form. Uh, and resultantly, the Bretherton diagram proved a uh, instant uh, effectively a interest, instantly iconic um, representation of how to comprehensively depict both how physical climate systems coupled with biogeochemical cycles through a series of feedbacks and forcings. As you can see from the whimsically shaded box on the right, uh, one of the first findings of the nascent Earth system science was that you could not hope to begin to approximate the current dynamics of the Earth system without taking into account the sum total of human activities. Rather, as the drawers of the diagram felt obliged to spell out, quote, the people of the earth are no longer simple spectators to the drama of the earth's evolution, but have become active participants on a worldwide scale, contributing to processes of global change that will significantly alter our habitat within a few human generations. A year later, several members of this committee helped establish the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, the IGBP of earlier, to serve as an institutional vehicle for holding their massively interdisciplinary under undertaking together and carrying it forward. And so circling back to where we began, it, it was in this context that Paul Crutzen frustratingly, frustratedly informed a room full of earth system scientists in Cuernavaca 13 years later that we're not in the Holocene anymore, we're in the Anthropocene. As I hope to have now shown, he was saying nothing new in making this claim. In fact, even the term Anthropocene itself had already been casually circulating among IGBP members such as Eugene Sturmer since the early 1980s. Instead, Crutzen offered his comment as a rhetorical prod to remind his colleagues of what they had already known for decades, namely that they were long past the point at which the impact of human activities on the Earth system could be ignored. Given this, I would like to conclude part two of this talk by claiming that it is this whimsically shaded box in the Bretherton diagram that becomes the anthropos of the Earth system Anthropocene. It is the totality of human beings reconceived universally in terms of flows of matter and energy that link them both inextricably to one another and the rest of the Earth system. No more, but certainly no less. And so with that, uh, let's turn to part three and conclude with several reflections on what may be at stake in these distinctions that I have so far described. Uh, for my first takeaway, I would simply like to reiterate that the universal man of Western humanism and the universal anthropos of the Anthropocene are categorically different where humanism has traditionally attempted to encompass all human beings under a universal definition of human nature, the anthropos of the earth system Anthropocene attempts to represent how all human beings universally interact with one another and the rest of terrestrial nature as throughputs of matter, energy, and information. The anthropos of the earth system Anthropocene approaches humanity in the process-oriented vernacular of system science, not normatively in the venerable language of philosophical anthropology or, Arist or Aristotelian metaphysics. In doing so, it shifts the emphasis from essence to process, substance to function, fixed identity to fluid relation, and displaces dubious attempts to permanently define humanity with a drive to understand how human patterns persist temporarily. In short, where the universal man of humanism attempts to identify what all human beings essentially are, the anthropos of the Anthropocene attempts to account for what all human beings collectively do. Conceived in the post-cybernetics and frankly non or post-humanist milieu of earth system science, the latter seeks to express the interactions that the sum total of human beings have with their planetary environments. 
continually shaping and being shaped in a dynamic dance performed on the edge of an ecological cliff. Given this, I believe that it would be a mistake to be too hasty in following the anti-humanists and dismissing this universal anthropos as yet another politically pernicious abstraction or humanist ruse. Instead, the combined effects of hydrogen weapons and systems science have transformed the sum total of all human beings into an urgent reality, one bound together without exclusion by the lineaments of earthly life and menaced collectively by the prospect of universal death. At the same time, however, I should hasten to add that while the anthropos of the Earth System Anthropocene offers a different kind of human universalism, this merely recontextualizes rather than replaces a focus on particular actors. Clearly, not all human activities are created equal. Although the system's Anthropocene makes it possible to universally encompass all human beings in a new way, this proves to be in no way incompatible with or diminishes the importance of addressing the activities of particular groups and their sometimes wildly disproportionate planetary impacts. In other words, and this is crucial, although one of the first lessons of the Anthropos is that all humans are appreciably connected, this awareness in no way precludes the possibility of scaling down to address specific clusters or kinds of connection and the wildly disproportionate roles that they play in sustaining the wealth, prestige, and power of some, the expropriation, exploitation, and exclusion of many, and the potential ruin of all. For my second takeaway, I would like to reiterate the importance that the prospect of universal death has played in these developments. Both the systems ecology of the 1950s and the earth system science of the 1980s took shape against the background awareness that human beings had acquired the ability to drastically disrupt their own conditions of planetary habitability. Having helped discover the chemical causes of the ozone hole and the potential for nuclear war, few appreciated this fact better than Paul Crutzen himself. Upon receiving the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1995, Crutzen took the occasion of his acceptance speech to, sh to share something truly alarming. The elements bromine, he noted, operates much like chlorine, the first C in CFCs, but turns out to be almost 100 times more destructive to ozone than chlorine on an atom per atom basis. Accordingly, Crutzen proposed, quote, this brings up the nightmarish thought that if the chemical industry had developed organobromine compounds instead of the CFCs, then without any preparedness, we would have had been faced with a catastrophic ozone hole everywhere and at all seasons during the 1970s probably before the atmospheric chemists had developed the necessary knowledge to identify the problem and the appropriate techniques for the necessary critical measurements. Given that nobody had given any thought to the atmospheric consequences of the release of chlorine or bromine before 1974, I can only conclude that mankind has been extremely lucky." End quote. Although he should have clearly said humankind, I think it equally clear that Crutzen was not attempting to raise the revenant of humanist man with this claim. Instead, I myself hear in this statement an attempt to reiterate the disturbing awareness that, human, that the human condition has changed and that the survival of all human beings now depends on the outcome of human actions. Rather than attempt to subsume human diversity under a single definition of man as the anti-humanist claim, the universal anthropos of the Earth system Anthropocene offers an important tool for those striving to preserve all forms of human diversity from collapsing into the total and undifferentiated uniformity of universal death. Lastly, I'd like to conclude by saying that the Earth system is too important to be left to Earth system scientists. Those alive today owe a deep debt to Crutzen and his colleagues for establishing an integrated framework for studying the Earth as a dynamic system of systems. We, should have, we would have drastically less knowledge about the severity of today's intersecting planetary crises absent their heroic and ongoing works of planetary study and synthesis. At the same time, however, knowledge is power. The advent of the hydrogen bomb introduced an exponential increase in the human power to alter planetary dynamics. Over the course of the next few decades, this hypertrophic increase in human power helped prompt a correspondingly large increase in human knowledge about how planetary dynamics function and the place of human activities within them. But this has been a rocky road. Back in the 1950s, the arrival of the hydrogen bomb led some to believe that the moment of absolute human mastery over nature had finally arrived. The new atomic power would permit man to engineer the lands, oceans, and atmospheres of the Earth on a vast scale to suit his needs. He would vaporize hurricanes, open inland oceans, and thaw the Arctic. By the 1970s, however, a growing awareness of the planet's complex interconnections revealed these plans to be wantonly destructive madness, and any subsequent public discussion of planet scale or so-called geoengineering became generally taboo. And yet, Ever since cybernetics, it is not only true that knowledge is power, but that information is control. Accordingly, it should come as no surprise that our growing information about how delicately balanced the Earth system may be should have inspired a corresponding temptation 
to begin to place a human thumb on these scales. It is Paul Crutzen who is widely credited with breaking the taboo against geoengineering with his widely cited 2006 article, Albedo Enhancement by Stratospheric Sulfur Injections. Here he proposed to blunt the effects of global warming by artificially reproducing the effects of volcanic eruptions to block a fraction of incoming sunlight. In many ways, this article and the explosion of research in solar ge geoengineering that has followed built logically on Crutzen's earlier work. It simply proposed to accomplish fractionally and deliberately the same kind of global cooling that would otherwise happen catastrophically and accidentally in the wake of the thermonuclear war. Interest in solar and other forms of geoengineering will only continue to grow as more and more people realize the catastrophic amounts of warming that human beings have already laid in store. And yet, as the disturbingly late discovery of nuclear winter and the near miss with bromine reveal, even seemingly slight perturbations to the Earth's system can carry potentially existential consequences for the web of life and the human habitability of the planet, none of which, given the degree of complexity at play, may prove to be detectable before the effects are irreversible. Solar geoengineering would be an inherently risky endeavor, but the prospect of embarking down this path will only grow in political salience over the coming decades. As it does so, there will be more and more calls to cool the planet for the sake of humanity. When responding to these calls, it will be crucial to keep in mind the anti-humanist warning about the many, many misuses of universal man. At the same time, it will be just as important to remember that those alive today are well past the point when all discussions about the universal fate of humankind as a whole can be dismissed as merely a humanist ruse. There are already activities underway and decisions being made that impinge on the survival of every living human being. These may have been brought to light by Earth system science, but they're ultimately political. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zimmer. Uh, as per CSAC uh, custom, we'll take questions in the room. Uh, give the CSAC pre and postdoc fellows the chance to ask the first question. Comment. Um, I see Mel on the list. And please remember to introduce yourself uh, uh, when you ask your question for our online audience. My name is Melissa Salm. I'm a biosecurity fellow here at CSAC. Um, Dan, I love this presentation. As an anthropologist of the contemporary myself, I'm constantly asking, what does it mean to be human today? And so I really love the concept work that you've provided and this reconfiguration of, of the figure of Anthropos. Um, I, I, my question is, what do you think could be the impact of this new way of thinking of Anthropos? And, and like where, in what domains do you think that this might be most needed? Um, and alternately, what are some translations that you foresee as potentially um, problematic or dangerous? No, thanks, Mel. Those are all really great questions. I think just firstly and most clearly that this systems anthropos would be really valuable in places like uh, economics, which are kind of fundamentally um, energy blind and don't seem to take a lot of these uh, questions of energetic and material flows into account and um, view fossil fuel inputs as um, something that only costs the amount of energy that it takes to extract and refine them and don't look at the net effects or the fact that this is a one-time use. So just kind of a general systems literacy more broadly among policymakers, uh, even if it's not obvious how to fully uh, create policies that are cognizant of all of these sorts of feedbacks and complex dynamics, just the humility that comes with being aware of the sort of um, just kind of general unpredictableness of this um, kind of systems epiphany that we've had since the 1950s would go a long way towards, uh, I think, curbing some of the hubris and short or exactly one uh, step ahead lookedness of um, contemporary planning. Great, I have Luis next, and then I have Don. Thank you, Dan. This is Luis Rodriguez. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at CSAC. This was a fantastic presentation. But uh, full disclosure, I studied at Hopkins, <laughs> political science department. So I got caught up in your explanation of anti-humanists, especially because there seems to be a division 
between neo-materialists who are also anti-humanists who actually embrace the conceptualization of the Anthropocene that also the Earth system folks have. So at some point, there was like a division in the anti-humanists between the people that hate the concept of the Anthropocene and the people that actually embrace the concept of the Anthropocene. And I wonder if you can tell us how that happened. Like why, what caused this bifurcation? Thanks. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question, Luis. I've definitely spent way more time thinking about this than I should have. And I think the short answer is basically um, anti-humanism was a dead end. It was people from within a humanist paradigm trying to put an end to any positive definitions of the human. And by the 1980s, kind of reaching this postmodern sense of malaise that will just kind of, if everything that we do is going to be exclusionary and potentially damaging, Let's just stop with a kind of a politics of whatever affinity, as someone like Giorgio Gombin said. Uh, what the type of anti-humanism you're describing, someone like, or Dane Bennett, for instance, emerges out of this anti-humanist movement, uh, but has discovered and really taken on board um, precisely these kind of system cybernetic uh, paradigm shifting discoveries. So I would call that post-humanist, which is effectively an anti-humanist plus system science. So it's a very, um, it's a continuity, but uh, still kind of informed by anti-humanist critiques, but taking this on board. Okay. Uh, Don and then Scott. Well, this is absolutely fascinating. A superb topic. Um, Beautifully presented, stimulating. Introduce yourself because not everybody knows who you are. Pardon? You can introduce yourself because not everybody. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Yes. Now, my name is Don Emerson. Um, I, I work upstairs in the Asia Pacific Research Center. So in some sense, this topic is, you know, light years away from what I claim to know something about, namely, uh, you know, Asia. Um, okay, uh, perhaps for that reason, I'm particularly attracted to what you said. I find it incredibly stimulating. And it prompts a couple of comments uh, or pseudo questions on my part. First of all, I'm delighted uh, with the references to Paul Crutzen. I think this is an individual who is grossly uh, under read, under underappreciated, and I think he is very timely for the moment that we are now facing. Now, um, what's fascinating about your presentation is that you started with a linguistic, almost, I mean, forgive me, this is not meant to be critical, a linguistic game. What is humanism? What is anti-humanism, right? And, and so there we are happily splashing in, in philosophy, right, in the world of philosophy. Um, but then you move to some very, I mean, existential is the right word, some, some very critical issues at the moment. Uh, I mean, clearly one of the most striking developments it seems to me in recent years is that a topic which I remember was consigned, that is global warming, uh, to conversations, you know, I remember particular people <clears throat> that I deal with in, in Southeast Asia saying, well, you know, that's something that you worry about, but you know, global warming, I mean, come on, you know, we're, we're all gonna be dead by the time that really makes a difference. Of course, that's, that's completely false at this present uh, juncture. And um, with regard to this issue of humanism, I would, I would prefer to think of it as essentialization. Mm -hmm. In one of the slides, you use the word essence, but it's easier for me to understand the overgeneralization. Um, you know, and, and frankly, that overgeneralization can move in any one of a, of a number of different normative directions. I actually know scholars <clears throat> who are not only in favor of the Anthropocene as a term, uh, but who believe that the Anthropos is essentially evil and that the, the cosmos, the world, right, will be better off without human beings. And uh, this may sound like an insane notion, but in your work, I would suspect that you may have come across such individuals, right? Uh, so the, the critical question here is essentializing. All people are not evil, right? All people are not destroying uh, the, the planet, at least not intentionally, although indirectly many of them obviously are, maybe even most of them are. Well, certainly in this room. Right, <laughs> exactly. Right, right, very, very good point. And, 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 and there are so many other ways of looking at this issue that are excluded, it seems to me, by the concentration on language. I think we've gone way beyond that. For example, artificial intelligence. How does artificial intelligence affect the fear of the Anthropos? Maybe there's a greater fear uh, that is more appropriately directed to one of the inventions of the Anthropos, 
especially if it's like Hal, right, in the movie. <laughs> and so that, that introduces a whole nother dimension. Not to mention, of course, the issue of what is to be done, Lenin's question, right, which unfortunately gets kind of sidetracked when we're talking about philosophy and language and so forth, but remains absolutely critical in the time given to us to try to do something about this. And again, mainly, I just want to say, terrific. Thanks. Um, I think you want to say? Yeah, no, thank you. Those action. are all um, really excellent points. Um, regarding the opening being a linguistic game, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, what I'm responding to in part is what's been called the linguistic turn in the humanities, and precisely the sense among people who are trained between the 1980s and the early 2010s that their whole job is playing linguistic games, that um, if you can just get definitions and meanings right, that that will somehow um, kind of solve politics. And so uh, the work here is trying to push back against that and show some of my colleagues who are absolutely brilliant that their anti-humanist critiques of what they think the normative content of definitions of the Anthropocene are, aren't doing the sort of political work that they think they're doing or distracting away from some of the more substantive things that you've raised. Um, on the question of essentialization and overgeneralization, I absolutely agree. Um, regarding whether or not the anthropos is essentially evil, I think, yeah, there's a really kind of growing uh, ecological pessimist and a very different form of anti-humanism that's um, emerged since the 1970s in kind of dark green wings of political thinking. Uh, for the anti-humanists that I showed up on the slides, those people were all still very concerned with being humane their critique of humanism was that it hadn't lived up to its own standards. And so they wanted it to do better. Uh, but there's a very different type of anti-humanism that is just a hatred of the human and what they see us as having done. That also does, I think, draw on this very kind of retrogressive essentialization and overgeneralization of human nature that believes that we are kind of necessarily uh, ecocidal creatures and wants to get rid of them on those grounds. I, in fact, have heard tell of two people who are studying synthetic biology with precisely those aims. Um, which is alarming. And then the question of going beyond language, I absolutely agree. Although at the same time, when you bring up something like AI, um, I got to see some of, it's you know Stanford, I got to go to HAI and see some of the founders of the contemporary AI revolution talking about how freaked out they were when they first saw GPT-4 come out of the oven and had acquired all sorts of capacities that GPT-3 didn't have, but they couldn't explain why beyond the fact that it had been trained on more data. And the way that this happened, was that they fed it the whole of human language. So there is a way in which um, language does have a power that even uh, leading AI researchers didn't anticipate. We didn't know that by putting all of language through these machine learning systems and these LLMs, these large language models, uh, we would create something that replicated so many of our general capacities in ways that we hadn't anticipated. I think, Rod, did you have a two finger in the back? One finger, okay. I have uh, Scott, then Paul, then Rod. And uh, I'm Scott Sagan, uh, co-director here and a professor of political science. Um, I wanted to draw you out on the final point that you made. As it says here in the slide, the knowledge of the model of Earth system's importance for power is the temptation to engineer it. And I assume your addition of at least the temptation is a hint or a recognition that you might screw it up or might not follow, uh, not use the power wisely. But your previous discussion about the anti-humanist critique also suggests that there are at least some who think that there's no responsibility uh, to do this, that, that, that there's something inherently um, wrong uh, about the Anthropocene identification. So, my question is, do you think that there's a responsibility, not just the power to engineer or to back engineer or reverse engineering in, in, in a sense, uh, what we've done to mitigate it? And if so, can you relate that to the anti-humanist critique that you are critiquing? Yeah, thanks, Scott. You know, by virtue of being at CSAC, I had the privilege of going to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory a few months ago and seeing some of the leaders in the field of geoengineering uh, discuss some of these very questions. And one of the things that most surprised me, A, was the humility that some of these people had. Um, they weren't the same sort of, uh, you know, behorned Exxon uh, cackling 
um, demons that you hear about in some of the environmental literature. These people, <laughs> not that I could tell, some of them wearing hats, so the jury's out. Um, but one of the things that most surprised me was that there weren't very many people who were um, advocating this as a good idea, but particularly the context had changed from declaring that we had a moral responsibility and a moral imperative to um, mitigate greenhouse gas emissions to recognizing that by 2023, we have released so many greenhouse gases that we've guaranteed enough warming that the moral imperative has switched from mitigation and adaptation to actively embarking on some form of geoengineering, if only to reduce the amount of incoming warming that we've already guaranteed. That the having failed with mitigation at this point, the burden is now doing something. And if that's the case, then it really does become a question of for whom are you doing it? And I think the anti-humanist would be right that anyone who, like Rex Tillerson, goes from having spent 40 years of his career at ExxonMobil claiming that uh, geoengineering, or that, uh, sorry, global warming doesn't exist, and actively funding all sorts of denialist campaigns, when he turns on a dime at the Council of Foreign Relations in 2014 and says that climate change is a engineering problem that admits an engineering solution, and we need to do this to save mankind, and implicitly capitalism and the shares of ExxonMobil, we should be immensely suspicious. But at the same time, um, provided that it's done for um, the people who would be most vulnerable in a way that can uh, be sustainable in terms of being paired with things like carbon capture and storage, um, I think there are arguments to be made that, like you say, it's no longer a matter of pearl clutching and we shouldn't intervene. Uh, having allowed ourselves to intervene this much, the onus may be on us to intervene in ways that mitigate the harm that we've already caused. Uh, Paul? So I'm Paul Edwards. Uh, I'm a fellow here at CSAC and director of the STS program. You know, it's a terrific talk, as everyone has already said. Um, just a couple of observations. One is that another way, and I, I sort of wonder whether you agree with this, another way to frame what you said about the anti-humanist critique is that you know, that generation of scholarship, and this, I think, persists into the present, was concerned or maybe even obsessed with the notion that there is no collective we that there is only there are only particular groups with particular interests and no such thing as society yeah exactly so that when you know but part of what you're saying here is that this version of the anthropo anthropos is exactly about the collective we and that because it's framed in, you know, in terms of energy, materials, throughputs, et cetera, it doesn't really uh, connect with that uh, sense of many different groups with many interests. Right? And yet, <laughs> I mean, partly, I, I mean, this is a debate I have every week in my kitchen, right? <laughs> so, because I, I live with someone who has, is much more on the uh, critique side. And, you know, the claim will always be, and it correctly, that you know, a small number of people in the world, the developed world, the wealthiest people in the de developed world are far more responsible for the state of things that we find ourselves in than any other group. And that the groups that are least responsible are suffering the most. You know, so that's very basic, constantly repeated critique. Um, so I'm just curious what you think about that way of thinking it. And then I just wanted to add on the subject of evil, um, so I, I shouldn't name this person since it was a private conversation, but at one of the last IPCC meetings, I had a conversation with someone who is, shall we say, very high up in the IPCC, and I've known her a really long time. So what do you think about this, Paul? Are we gonna survive it? <laughs> and I said, I don't think so. And she said, I think we're a cancer on the planet and we're, we're, we're toast. Uh, yikes, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> that all sounds, um, I agree with you. I think that part of what I'm trying to do with this paper that the talk is based on is just kind of a public service announcement. I, th I think that there are a lot of really brilliant people who are misinvesting their energy in what is a very important critique, but also to some extent beating a humanist dead horse. The only people who bring up humanism or who talk in a humanist idiom are the anti-humanists who are critiquing it. The Earth system scientists, they're not humanists. They don't care about the essential nature of man. 
They see you as a plastic system of systems all the way from your mitochondria to your cells, to your organs, to your body, to your social milieu. So um, there's that. Um, and yeah, at the same time, I find that the linguistic turn, this concern with the politics of naming and definition uh, and the sense that there are only um, groups with many interests and no common interest with kind of incipient hindsight really played hand in glove into some of the most pernicious political developments the last 40 years. And that you know these people would identify with neoliberalism. So I think in part, um, some of the later people in my anti-humanist board be associated with post-structuralism and post-modernism. One of the reasons that they were so influential was that they actually developed a lot of this kind of system and cybernetic language and, and your term discourse, but they did so in a way that kind of obscured the origins of it. So they became kind of the gatekeepers of this knowledge while cutting off a subsequent generation of theorists uh, from the origins of these very powerful ideas. So it seemed like they had some sort of unique explanatory power about what's going on, but people who only relied on uh, Michel Foucault or Derrida, but were ignorant of Howard Odom and Barry Commoner and Norbert Wiener, lacked the depth of the tools and kind of the underlying principles to make better sense of their time and spent 40 years chasing their own linguistic tales. And as to whether or not we're a cancer on the planets, you know, it's funny because I find working at the Stanford Existential Risk Initiative that my love of humanity is somewhat brittle. It uh, requires that I not follow American politics too closely to still be invested in spending every day trying to avert the end of the world. But at the same time, uh, some of the most amazing people who have fought in this space, like Bertrand Russell, he wrote a whole fiction book after he won the Nobel Prize in fiction and decided I should probably write fiction uh, since they don't give it to philosophers. Uh, and the whole book was a fantasy about blowing up the world. He seemed to oscillate on a daily basis between love and hatred of humanity. But that is partly, I think, the risk of caring deeply about humanity and its futures, that you will be disappointed. And that um, it is scary, though, that people who have those dark days are now able to access tools of uh, synthetic biology or AI-assisted design to act on those myth misanthropic urges in the way they didn't before. So. Uh, two fingers, Scott, and then to Rod. Dark, dreamy wing of the, of the community, your invention, or is that somebody else's invention? Or an absence? Oh, it's a, a self identification, I think, the dark greens. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah I think yep. I've talked to dark greens who call themselves dark greens. Oh, very good. Okay. Um, yeah. But I can't tell you where I picked that up. Yeah. Rod? Um, so I'm Rod Ewing. I'm a co-director with Scott at, here at CSAC, and perhaps more relevant to this discussion, a professor of earth science. And so I, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation, and I had no idea of the anti-humanist uh, movement. Uh, your description of earth scientists is probably um, very true, that is, we're just modeling the chemistry and physics of atoms and uh, material and energy through through the system. Um, I like very much that you went back to the 1950s and uh, uh, the, the realizations that came from uh, ecology and the work of uh, Barry Commoner and how that, and your description of how that grew into a wider systems approach so that today, uh, whether it's in the new school of sustainability or on an academy committee, uh, you only have to wait a few moments before someone says that we really need to take a systems approach to, to the problem. But that brings me to your, your third bullet, where you say knowledge and information equal power and control. Um, what I challenge is whether that's true or it can even be discerned from a broader systems analysis. And by what I mean by that is that from a scientific point of view, if you give me a small enough system, I have a chance. Okay, I, I can benefit from the systems analysis. But with the enthusiasm of the systems analysis, as you 
increase the size of the system, if you let economics matter, if you let sociology matter, if you put everything into the bucket that you're analyzing, um, there's a certain level of knowledge that you might gain, but in practice, and in my experience, actually your knowledge of the system and your power, sense of power and control over the system decrease. And I think, or would suggest, that's maybe the next stage where we realize everything's, you know, somehow connected, as Barry Commoner uh, pointed out. But trying to make all those connections in an scientific way or an intellectual way somehow becomes a barrier to action. And it could be that going back to a sense of values, um, one can <laughs> approach problems in complex systems more easily than you can if you try to uh, model them. So that's not so much a question as a suggestion or a suggested comment from my perspective. No, those points are all very well taken. Thank you for sharing your perspective. You know infinitely more about that side of this equation than I do. Um, I guess I should have specified more knowledge equals more power and more information, more control, or at least for certain people, the illusion thereof. Um, for someone like Ross Ashby, he coined uh, what he termed the law of requisite variety in this notion that only complexity can be used to kind of mitigate complexity. And whether or not that's true, I think the last, well, really 20 years has seen the hope, we'll see if it's borne out, that these kind of new walls that we've encountered in terms of um, adding more things to the model and the becoming more and more unwieldy could be surmounted precisely by bringing the requisite variety of AI systems to bear on them that we'll never understand what this is. But if we can create something that's approaching an artificial general intelligence that has the ability to review more data than a human being could in its lifetime, then maybe it will make sense of them. And we can just kind of step back and let some sort of truly air sets God solve everything for us. So, um, likewise. Okay, final uh, point to Mel. All right, I just wanted to piggyback off of your last statement. Um, because when you do concede that we are existing in a complex system and everything is interconnected and ecologically impacting one another, it does seem that like it becomes really difficult to identify causality or causation in any determinate way. And so, um, and a lot of like our decision-making processes rely upon the ability to determine causation. Um, and so I just think that it's a provocative uh, point that like be beginning to think in this way like m might require new ways to make decisions if we can't just kind of um, assume we can intervene in any causal pathway. Yeah, it's not hugely helpful when some sort of systems thinker comes into your boardroom and tells you that all causation is circular and that doing is non-doing. Well, with those words, I think we've come to the end of uh, our research <laughs> seminar. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Dan Zimmer. <laughs>